is how democratic is truth. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. We live in an age when people assume that knowledge should be available equally to all. In matters susceptible of judgment by normal common sense, however, everyone knows there are exceptions. Access to a control room for intercontinental missiles is limited by universal consent to a very few. Access to the controls of a passenger airliner is limited to those with the necessary knowledge for operating them, and also to those with proper authorization. If people don't see the disadvantages of making more subtle knowledge universally available, it is only because they are ignorant of the risks involved. In the case of subtle knowledge, the main disadvantage in making it universally available is the harm it might do to one who isn't ready for it and who might even mock it. True, by mocking truth he might undermine the faith of a few truth seekers, but then such tests can also be beneficial as a means of strengthening faith. Again true. The clever doubter's misrepresentation of those truths may dissuade a few seekers from following the spiritual path. But if a seeker really is sincere, he will recognize the truth eventually because it resonates with his own being. No, the greatest problem accrues to the shallow doubter himself. To give him an opportunity to affirm his ignorance might only estrange him even more from the truth delaying the time when he will turn, as all people must, eventually, to the light. Thus, the scriptures advise not secrecy, but discretion in the sharing of truth. Jesus Christ says in the Gospel of St. Matthew, 
Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. And Sri Krishna says in the 18th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Never speak of these truths who, to one who is without self-control or devotion, who renders no service, who does not care to hear, or who speaks ill of me. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. <clears throat> this is from Yogananda's Whispers from Eternity. Demand for the pearls of wisdom obtained in the sea of meditation. Divine Father, teach me to dive deep for the pearls of thy wisdom in the ocean of meditation. Teach me to plunge headlong, protected in the diving suit of conscience, that the sharks of passion may not destroy me. If by one or two divings I find not thy wisdom pearls. Let me not call the sea of meditation devoid of any pearl of thy wisdom. Teach me rather to find fault with my own diving. Teach me to dive again and again in meditation, deeper and deeper always, until I find thine immortal pearls of wisdom and of divine joy. I'd like to welcome all of you here for a Sunday service this morning. As Ananta said, our subject is how democratic is truth. Uh, when I first came to Ananda, it was uh, in the 70s, 1976, uh, that first summer I had a few friends, close friends, visit me here at Ananda over the course of that summer. And I wouldn't say that I was real evangelistic in my description of Ananda or life here, but I was real enthusiastic. I, from the minute I landed, I, uh, I felt that finally at that point in my life, I found my home. So I was pretty excited about it, and I pretty freely shared with my friends through letters about life here at Ananda, what it was like. Uh, what the monks and the nuns were like. We had quite a many at that time. Uh, what it was like to uh, have nothing and serve God and work for God all day and into the night. What, it was, what service was about. What my newly found spiritual teacher was like. So again, I was very freely giving out all of this information. And they came. They weren't connected. They were all different friends. And uh, connected with different groups of people, but over the course of that summer they did come. And they came to check it out just for a day. I, it wasn't, I don't even remember them staying overnight uh, to see how I was doing, and most especially to convince me that what I was doing was totally wrong, uh, that I was on the wrong path, that I was um, being convinced against my will, perhaps even brainwashed. And uh, and then in very short order, I, I showed them around the community. I had them meet friends of mine. And then they left. And they left my life at that point. I never heard from them again. And I don't know to this day whether uh, they completely were rebuffed you know, uh, to the spiritual path, if they ever again looked to the spiritual path in a spiritual direction. Frankly, I just I really don't know. Uh, but it came to me when I was uh, preparing for this service, reading this reading, and Swamiji, in the commentary, he addresses the appropriateness of truth. Truth is, is, truth is, and it is for everyone. Ultimately, on a soul level, it's, it's ours to behold and experience. But what it's really about is the receptivity of the individual. I think it's very helpful to look at what is known as the caste system in India. Our tradition has roots in India, so it's something we're largely familiar with, most of us. And it has counterparts in all parts of the world. It may not go by that name. 
But in its inception, the, the caste system was really a way to honor the individual in terms of whatever knowledge they are in possession of within the moment, to honor the individual and the unique uh, path that that individual will walk in its, his or her evolution toward God. And to look at that soul, considering that, and to support that soul in whatever way that soul can be supported, and then directionally to hold out where we are all headed to divine bliss and to provide whatever opportunity exists to help that person of their own free will access that. Well, today it's really something that's quite different, and it's understandable if we consider the cycles of time and the descending yugas, and over the millennia, as we moved more into a material consciousness, the form tightened, the structure tightened, and the caste system tightened, such that you have something that binds and limits people. It was never intended to do that. You know, for example, you could look at someone in business and there's very many, many different ways to do business. There's the adharmic way and the dharmic way. And there's looking at the people who are our customers, our clients, and just thinking, what can I get out of this? And how much profit can I make? And how much can I earn, irregardless of any consideration for the individual? But then there's the business of dharma and doing dar business dharmically and doing it from an orientation of how can I serve this person, irregardless of what the cost is to me, irregardless of how long it takes to do this, but how can I serve this person? That's a very different orientation. And the way the caste system began originally was to always try and take where someone was at and then lift them up a notch, support them in their growth upward to greater awareness, to greater expansion. But now we have this very constricted uh, format. And as I said, it's just, it's part of the descending yuga. We will and we are breaking out of it these systems that are really global uh, in their existence um, and trying to look more at the soul and trying to, again, honor what is the individual nature. We can look at our own living wisdom schools here at the village and now really around the world. Uh, built on the principles of education for life, which Swami Kriyananda outlined in his book by that name. And in the same way, it looks at the individual soul, the student, the child, and what are the, what are the attributes, the qualities, the affinities that that soul has brought into this life. And then we start there honoring that, always looking directionally at what is the next step of growth? What is the next step that this individual can take to be able to be more open to truth and being more open to truth than express that in their lives? So you see, it's, it, the truth is there, but it's honoring the individual and what is appropriate, what is timely, what is really of benefit on a soul level. Yogananda had a dream in which he was this great philanthropist. And he was so excited at his circumstance because he had at his fingertips all of the resources he needed financially to fix everything on the planet. He had at his resources all he needed in terms of educated people, people with skills, civil engineers, architects, designers, builders, farmers, I mean, just all of it to go out there and take care of the needs of the world. And he did just that with this incredible team. He went out there and he eliminated poverty and he, elim and he built homes for the homeless and he started businesses and he created beautiful agriculture and just everything with, with providing a, a relative, filling the needs of individuals so that they wouldn't have to worry about that and they could think in more godlike ways. But at the end of the dream, af after fixing everything on a global level, he stepped back and he watched it for a while. And he realized that given all of, of what had just occurred and, and really taking care of people on the material plane and helping to provide for them, that it hadn't really changed people's lives. 
They weren't really any more open to truth. They weren't, by and large, more open to higher consciousness. They were just going along and enjoying this world as always, now bettered a little bit for them. And he realized in that dream, and through him, all of us, that reminder that we can't just heap truth on people. We can't just take something that is extremely meaningful and dear and close to us, makes perfect sense. It is true, and it is universal. And we can't just take that and throw it at people and expect them to get it. What to speak of, get it and go forward with it and not be repulsed by it or not be turned aside, not, you know, just way too much. You know, maybe I gave my friends too much information, as the saying goes these days. And uh, just a little too much over the edge and kind of, I don't want anything to do with that. And you see people, you know, there's, Sananto was just telling me yesterday, he loves figures and we're up to 7 billion people on this planet right now. And truth is there, but, you know, given where we are at at a certain point in time, we may or may not be open to that, even as devotees, even as disciples. Swami Kriyananda tells a story of when he was uh, with Yogananda at Mount Washington there as a monk. And Yogananda from the onset asked him oftentimes to lead yoga postures. And so he was called on many occasions to demonstrate those for visiting guests and also outside of the monastic community, the, the fellowship grounds. And on this one occasion he was invited to a Jewish bar mitzvah and he was asked to demonstrate yoga postures, and he did. Somehow that fit into the ceremony. I don't know how or afterwards, but there was this gathering just afterwards socially and people coming together and sharing. And there was this uh, psychiatrist, very materialistic psychiatrist, who approached him right away and started talking to Swamiji and challenging everything, his beliefs entirely, just point after point after point. And Swamiji, is very, he's very clear-minded, he's very knowledgeable and, and was very attuned to his guru. And he had there the, the uh, points to meet him with, you know, and he, could, and he was able to answer and address questions, but really to no, no avail. And so finally, after some time, he reached in his pocket, so to speak, and he pulled out uh, all these miracles that he had in his time with Yogananda, it was just a few, three and a half years or so, but he, that he had witnessed uh, miracles for which Yogananda had been an instrument. And he shared these with this psychiatrist and still nothing. And eventually they parted their ways. Well, a few days went by and Yogananda invited Swami Kriyananda to, he was Walter's then, but invited him to demonstrate the yoga postures for some visiting guests. They were having a luncheon. And afterwards, everyone had gone, and it was Master and Swamiji. And Yogananda said to Swamiji, by the way, the next time you're with people who are real materialistic, who are atheist, don't talk about miracles. (laughs) And just as an aside, in that instant, Swamiji said, you knew. And Master said, I know every single thought that you think. Really quite something. But the point being that, again, we can't just throw truth at people and expect that they will get it. And, and if they don't get it, well, then what? And it's not, it's not being judgmental. You know, this reading in the Bible about dogs and swine, I've never liked it personally. It's just kind of icky, but, um, but it's very graphic. You certainly get what, what's being talked about here. And it's not meant to be literal. It's not meant to be graphic in a literal sense. It's just meant to drive home the point. And uh, that it's about receptivity, that it's about receiving truth and being open to truth. It's about consciousness. And so we need to consider, we need to ask ourselves, what is of benefit. I mean, is it really of benefit to share all this information? Is it really of benefit, even though I feel totally excited about it and feel like it's true and it's real and people could really be helped if they came to Ananda? People could really be helped if they came to Spiritual Renewal Week? Why don't they come? And, 
You know, it's, it's really asking what would be a benefit at this time to this individual. Again, looking at the individual and assisting in whatever way that we can. I remember years ago in Sacramento, Anant and I were leaders there for Ananda for a number of years. And after some friends of ours, they had received Kriya. And maybe a few years before this, I don't remember the exact timeline, but they had been Kriya bonds for some time. And somehow we were talking about meditation, and one of them just said, oh, I'm way beyond Kriya. I just, I, I mean, it caught me off guard. I didn't know what to say. I guess I probably thought, really? But I was, I was speechless. And, um, and yet, I, I mean, I know that could be possible. You know, our teachings also, I mean, when the fruit is ripe, it falls. You know, one of, the, one of the cautions when you get Kriya is if you go into bliss, go with it. Forget the technique. Okay, so I understand that. But I, I dare say if someone was, had probably was in that realized state, they wouldn't be also saying that because the techniques are so much of benefit, so much conductors of power to those who in that moment can benefit by them and use them to know God. So this person said that, and I was just, well, okay, and, um, and just let it, you know, let it go. I just, I really didn't know how to address it. There wasn't receptivity for higher truth in that moment, so I just, you know, backed off. But Yogananda, when he talks, for example, about Kriya, he says that our human being, our, our brain, our nervous function, brain system function, our nervous system function, we operate at about the equivalent of a 50-watt light bulb. I know it's not a very attractive analogy, but that's what he said. And it, again, it just drives home the point. And he said, we have to prepare the nervous system, the spinal system, to receive Kriya, to receive the billion watts that is channeled through Kriya. So there you are. It's just another example of levels of truth and the appropriateness of the application and of really doing service to others. That's what it's about. And so we have in Kriya, for example, we have this process by which one prepares oneself to receive Kriya. Now, some people, this just turns them off completely. Why can't I just have it right now? But again, it's the refinement of the, of the nervous system, the refinement of the energy in the spine and of the brain to receive that. Because if there isn't that refinement, and I've heard people say this too, oh, I don't really get anything from that. Well, what happened there? <laughs> what happened there? You know, we have to ask. Uh, we didn't do our job is what happened there. And uh, in preparation, it's not just because we're an organization and we're trying to organize everything, but we're trying to help people. And this is how we've learned to help people, is to prepare them and nurture the receptivity within them, wherever they're at. And so it's not a condemnation of dogs and swine. It's a recognition of an individual soul and how we can benefit that soul, how we can serve that soul. Swami Kriyananda said, if we, you know, if we can't help people outwardly at this point in time because of a lack of receptivity, what we can do is to pray for them. And he said specifically to talk to God in your heart about those people, not what their shortcomings are, their flaws, but just talk to God about them, your wishes for them, your concern for them, your hopes for them, not what you want, you know, not how you want to remake them into your own image, or what you think is right for them, but just to include God in, in your prayer and your wish for their spiritual benefit, for their spiritual growth. And then he goes on to say, when you're walking down a street, you know, in town or in an urban area in the city with people you don't even know, to try to single out a person or maybe, a, you know, one person after another, whatever, but to try to tune in to an individual that you see, just a passerby, and to try to behold and acknowledge God in that form. Because that's really the, that's probably the highest thing and the most powerful thing we can do to help others be receptive to truth, is to hold them in the light 
and to remember that they're a child of God and they have their own individual path. It's not a judgmental thing. It's not this person is worthy and that person is not worthy. You know, I'm on God's team or God left me out or whatever it is. It's not judgmental. It's really honoring the soul and how we can work with that and how we can in some way move that along because we realize our own happiness and we realize, as Swamiji has said so often times, that other people's happiness and ability to experience happiness is felt within our own being and enhances our own sense of bliss and happiness. So that's where the concern is and that's where the concern comes from. Yogananda, one of the disciples once, was uh, pestering Yogananda, give me samadhi, give me samadhi, give me samadhi. And finally, Yogananda said, if I give it, can you take it? And the disciple, being a great disciple, realized the truth in the moment of that statement and said to Master, no. But be assured that wherever we are, geographically on this planet, in this universe, in this cosmos, that in consciousness, God will come to us where we are at. And in consciousness, God will come to us as truth that we are able to perceive in that moment and also point the direction very lovingly um, for us in how to embrace a greater truth. That we have all been given pearls of wisdom in this life, incredible pearls. We've been given pearls that are priceless and that are irreplaceable through the inner darshan of the guru, through the blessing and grace of the guru, through these techniques. And they are exactly suited in this moment to who we are and what we can rise to spiritually. And that all the time, God and guru are working with us in this way, the masters are working in this, with us in this way to lead us to greater awareness. And if we can heighten our receptivity, like holding that person on the street in light, holding our own selves in the light, we are on God's team, we are close to God, and God is close to us. And that's the openness that will draw truth, that will be of use to us at this time, and will help us as well to be able to draw on the truth that will serve our guru bhais and our friends and the perfect stranger. So, thank you. No. Mm-hmm.